Thank you very much. Um, and also, I just wanted to really thank the organisers of the symposium today. It's just been such... I mean, they've done a really good job of just curating these really interesting themes for us and drawing in a wide range of perspectives. So there's been some really great discussion today, so I hope we can continue that too. Um, so this personhood theme, I think, is a really good way um, to end the conference because it kind of takes us a little bit back to first principles, really, um, kind of the core of what we're talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence. And you know, really, what we're talking about is how can machines simulate aspects of human intelligence, including learning? And, you know, and, and that was really kind of the Dartmouth statement, which led to all of us sitting here right in this room right now. So um, you know, us humans, I think we have a tendency to anthropomorphize things. Um, and I'm sure we'll probably be talking a little bit about that on this panel. Um, but in recent years, I think as AI has broken out of the lab and, and really captured the public imagination, you know, personhood has really been front of mind and has really been something that's, that's been dominating the headlines too. Um, and there are certainly legal dimensions to that, but also, also moral ones as well. So, you know, from a, from a legal perspective, um, most current regulation of AI is kind of geared to um, regula regulating artificial intellects as tools um, that are used by human actors. But with the increasing autonomy of these types of technologies, their movement from being tools to actors, um, there's really big questions around whether existing regulatory approaches are, are sufficient to give us just outcomes. Uh, the other dimension, um, and we're lucky to have a, a philosopher on our panel today, um, is a little bit more complex. What circumstances might give rise to society thinking uh, that we need to give rights and other aspects of, of human personhood um, to artificial intellects? You know, in what circumstances might be there, might there be a moral imperative um, to endow these entities with these kinds of rights? Um, and I think the other question about that is really, well, with artificial uh, general intelligence doesn't exist right now. And so is, is, is it all too premature to be thinking about those types of really high level philosophical questions right now? Or should we be thinking about them? You know, should we let them um, permeate the development of these technologies? Should we be starting to think about litmus tests um, for those types of things now? Uh, so with that, I just want to do a quick intro of our panel. Um, so in no particular order, I'll just run left uh, on my side through to right. So I'm, I'm really delighted to introduce Jessica Fjeld. So she's a lecturer in law uh, at Harvard Law School, and she's also assistant director of uh, the Cyber Law Clinic at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And I was saying to Jessica earlier, I, I'm a big fan of uh, BKC, and I have used many of their tools and papers over the years, so they produce really excellent work. Uh, so Jessica focuses her legal practice on uh, the impact of um, on issues that impact digital media and art, and that includes IP, that includes corporate law, freedom of expression, privacy. Uh, and she's also done quite a bit of recent work in the AI space too, and, and that's been dealing with AI-generated art and the impact of the human rights community on the AI for good conversation. Uh, I've also got Yoon Shea here. So he's a senior associate at Baker McKenzie, so he's a colleague and collaborator of mine. Um, he advises on IP matters with a focus on patent litigation. Uh, and he, was, he also served as the firm's first fellow at the World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in San Francisco, uh, where he was involved in, in researching ethical and, and legal implications of various AI and other uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies. Uh, and then he's also contributed to the firm's response uh, to the European Commission's draft AI ethics guidelines. And then in addition to that, um, he regularly writes and, and comments on various AI developments. Uh, I also have here Dr. Jerry Kaplan. Um, we're really delighted to have Jerry. He's a, he's a renowned uh, AI expert, serial entrepreneur. Uh, he's a technical innovator, and he's also a best-selling author as well. Uh, he's currently a, a lecturer and a research affiliate here at Stanford, where he teaches the social and economic implications of AI. Uh, and of course, uh, he also founded several Silicon Valley technology companies, including two public uh, companies. Uh, and then, so he's the, he's the best-selling author of Silicon Valley, uh, uh, sorry, a startup of Silicon Valley adventure, 
Humans Need Not Apply, A Guide to Wealth and Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, and Artificial Intelligence, What Everyone Needs to Know. Uh, and then we also have with us Professor Mark Crimmins. Uh, he teaches in Stanford's philosophy department, having previously taught at Cornell uh, and at the University of Michigan. He works in the philosophy of language and of the mind and has written the nature of concepts, mental representations and propositional attitudes on inexplicit thought uh, and also on the semantics of natural language. Okay, so we have a, a fantastic panel. We've got legal uh, perspectives, we have business perspectives, and we also have philo philosophical perspectives. So we'll ho hopefully we will be able to have a really rich discussion. Um, so we thought to kick things off um, just to really lay the framework for this discussion and think about what exactly do we mean when we talk about personhood uh, in an AI context. So um, I wanted to ask Jerry just to kind of kick things off, um, or, or Mark, would you like to handle things first. Well, maybe I'll, 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 I'll give it a second. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe Mark, would you like to I'll kick things it. off and then Jerry, you can... I can disagree. Sure. <laughs> Does it, or agree, agree to disagree. <laughs> right, so um, I, I take it that we're going to be discussing for a good portion of this of the session um, the question of whether and how we should accord to artificial systems some of the legal statuses that we currently accord only to human beings, human persons. Um, but there's in addition to that question, the question um, uh, whether it's, it's conceivable or actual that uh, some of these systems are or will be actually persons, where I'm using the word person not in a, a technical legal sense, but in the ordinary sense. I consider this question uh, a real deal question. That's a, a lot like um, some other questions. Can could, could computers, computers or artificial systems really feel pain, really um, feel emotions, really be creative, th things like that, where uh, there's the idea is that there's a literal use of these, these concepts, and we're asking whether these concepts as literally understood um, would truly apply, or might truly ap apply to actual or conceivable artificial systems. Um, so um, these questions, are interesting just in, in themselves, right? Could, a, could a, uh, a digital machine or an artificial machine be conscious, et cetera, et cetera. But the, also, they, they might be of interest because they might have uh, practical, moral, legal relevance to how we ought to treat systems in, in certain circumstances. So it connects to the to notions of legal personhood um, in that way. Um, so there's a kind of, for a philosopher of mind, there's a kind of optimistic scenario about how philosophy of mind might contribute um, to, to this enterprise. It would be it, as, as follows. We have these concepts, belief, understanding, um, pain, person, and we want to know um, what it is for those concepts to apply to something. Right? What, what does it take for these concepts to be correctly applicable? What are the application conditions? Um, and philosophers can contribute by uh, trying to uh, figure that out, by um, trying to come up with, for a given concept like pain, necessary and sufficient conditions for a system to be capable of pain and in pain. Um, and having done so, then we can uh, answer the question about what, what, whether it's conceivable for the, certain kinds of artificial systems to literally meet these conditions and um, be capable of, of those states and properties. Um, and then we can pass the baton to the uh, ethicists and, and have them uh, uh, reason about the, the consequences for how we ought to treat systems in various contexts. Unfortunately, I think that is a very optimistic, too optimistic scenario and, and for a few reasons. First, um, it, it kind of assumes that philosophers of mind are going to agree about something, and that's... Um, <laughs> An unlikely prospect at best. Um, um, but um, secondly, it, it assumes something about these concepts themselves that might not be true. Now, there are some concepts that have, as I'll say, a, a very broad purview. They um, are um, addressable to very, very different kinds of things, like the concept of mass or rest mass. Um, we can ask about an elephant or refrigerator or an Oreo cookie. And, and, 
the question of what's, what's its mass makes perfect, perfect sense as, um, as addressed to any of these things. There are other concepts that I regard as more parochial, that they're, they're only really addressable to or decide questions with respect to um, a subclass of, of cases. And I think of a lot of anatomical co concepts like pancreas, for instance, as, as in that category. That, um, whether a structure in a human uh, is a pancreas is, is a there are pretty clear answers to that question. Similarly, for very closely related species, the you know, mammals and birds and re reptiles, um, uh, there, there are, are structures that developmentally and um, through evolution are very closely related to our pancreas. And um, so it's pretty clear that they, that they are pancreases as well. But if you start to imagine um, other natural or, or created creatures that have structures that do similar jobs to our pancreases, the, the, the literal question, are those structures literally pancreases, I think loses bite, that, that there's, there's no determinate way of answering that kind of question. So my second concern about the optimistic scenario is that I think it might well be that a lot of our mentalistic person-level concepts, even the concept of a person, but also the concept of consciousness, pain, um, understanding, et cetera, might be parochial, might be the, the, the case that the, it's clear how it applies in our, in our own case, but, there, but the concept is not set up to address um, uh, systems rather different from us in, um, in, in their uh, constitution in particular. Uh, I think that uh, is likely to be a, a hurdle to answering the, the uh, real deal questions um, for our artificial systems. Um, okay, uh, and uh, yeah, um, so what what you do when you when you um, try to extend a, a concept like pancreas to a, a new domain is it it, it's, it calls for not conceptual analysis but conceptual engineering. We have to make a decision. And we'll make it for hopefully good pragmatic reasons as to whether to use the word pancreas now in this uh, a more general functional <coughs> sense rather than a way that is uh, parochial and local. I'll close with one final reason uh, to think that um, the optimistic scenario is not likely to, to, uh, to take hold and uh, that m maybe we oughtn't to worry about it. The philosopher Peter Strassen thought that the real deal question about free will um, as applied to humans, do, do, do humans really have free will? Um, he, he was con concerned about people who, th who think that the answer to that might be no, that free will is something that requires a certain kind of physical magic um, that doesn't take place in our brains, and so, th so we don't, in fact, have, have free will. And Strassen's concern was, well, why should we be all up in arms if that's the case? Right? Why, why should we be all, all up in arms? His idea is that even if that's, that were so, even if we got convinced that that were so, it would not cause havoc in... Um, the way we treat each other, the way we hold each other responsible for our actions, even if we're not, in some metaphysical sense not responsible for our actions owing to the physical causation <coughs> of our actions. It might nonetheless um, be the case that it's just human nature to engage with each other in the kinds of relationships that make sense of holding responsible um, and uh, reacting with uh, gratitude and uh, resentment. So that our practices of, of treating each other as, as responsible persons might survive um, uh, even a dramatic no answer to some of these hard questions as applied to ourselves. So, so Jerry, what's your response to that? I mean, do you, do you think the time has now come for us to have a, really, a, a real debate around personhood for artificial intellects, or is this just like an anthropomorphic conceit? Thank you. <laughs> using my term. <laughs> uh, no, it's not the time. Uh, I don't see any evidence that uh, we're anywhere near close to that. And the fact that uh, uh, AI and AGI share two letters is uh, somehow driving, and the, and the way in which these things are presented publicly uh, in terms of human and anthropomorphic terms is, is leading us to believe that we're somehow on the path to AGI. But one of those is about a software technology and the other one is a fantasy. Uh, I, you know, to understand this difference, this is a little bit like asking, 
Uh, it's perfectly reasonable to ask whether the uh, wildlife uh, management people in, in uh, Yellowstone uh, should, what, what uh, policies they should follow in dealing with the wolf population. But you can't go, get from there to what should those people do about werewolves. That's, that's the same kind of difference. One of these things is real, and the other one is, is a little more than, uh, than a fantasy. So uh, these ideas that we should personify our machines, it just has no basis in fact that I can see, or it's, it's foolish to do so. And so the philosophical questions, which I think were you know, very well put by uh, uh, Professor Crimmins, uh, they just don't apply to machines. You know, it's, it, you might as well ask, well, should we have rules or laws about whether you're allowed to abuse your laptop? Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't, doesn't really make any sense given the current mm -hmm. state of the art. So just before we started, we were having a conversation, um, all of us around, you know, this idea of personhood is really two questions. It's kind of, on one hand, there's the legal personhood mm -hmm. question. And on the other hand, there's that moral personhood question. So is it possible if the time has now come to have a real conversation around whether uh, artificial intellects or certain types of AI systems should be given some aspects of legal personality just from a utilitarian regulatory perspective. Could we park the moral questions, including about sentient AI and other more complex issues for another day if and when AGI becomes a reality? Well, if we discover that werewolves are real, we should start to talk about wildlife management for werewolves. <laughs> uh, so I, I do think that's true. I just think for the audience here, uh, most of them are very sophisticated. We've got to keep these things completely separate. Mm -hmm. And while we've heard an interesting, a very valuable characterization of the problem of the concept of personhood, you know, how broadly should it be applied in the common sense meaning the term, I'm not sure the audience understands the legal concept of personhood. Mm -hmm. That would be less likely, although we are here at the law school. And, you know, yeah. maybe you know, somebody else on the panel might be yeah. better capable so of uh, discussing what Yoon and Jessica, I think you guys would be um, perfect to weigh in here. So maybe Yoon, just starting with you, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit in preparing for this um, about the legal practical um, mm -hmm. questions that come up when it comes to uh, regulating these technologies. Yeah. Are there real reasons why we should be talking about legal personhood? for these types of systems. Yeah, I believe there is a reason. I mean, I do agree with Jerry in terms of kind of the human, natural humanhood, I mean, personhood. Um, that might happen, but I think a lot of experts uh, uh, believe that it might happen anywhere from 2029 until, you know, maybe uh, end of the century. So there is a wide gap. And even if AGI is realized, it doesn't mean that they will necessarily feel pain as you were discussing earlier. So I think we could park that uh, for a little later in foreseeable future. But with regard to legal personhood, I mean, it's essential we have already a lot of artificial legal personalities like uh, corporations back in the day, uh, the East uh, Dutch, uh, what was it? not bank, company was... Oh, it's uh, Dutch Indies. Yeah, company. that was the yep. first uh, legal uh, personality. Um, but it really boils down to, you know, what are some of the economic or utilitarian benefits of establishing such personalities? And if so, then it's just, you know, we as society uh, grant this certain legal rights and duties so that it's protected uh, under the law. But I think it ultimately comes down to weighing the benefits versus some of the maybe social and economic uh, risk and harms caused by it. Um, so I it, think the time is ripe, at least for legal personality. And it would seem that in that year, when answering those questions, it's fairly possible to separate rights and obligations and just allocate a set of obligations to AIs and leave the rights for another day. Um, what, what would your thoughts be on that, Jessica? Yeah, so um, I think it's pretty interesting given the like broad scientific consensus, which Jerry has represented well, and and um, you just gave a, a view too. Also, that you know artificial general intelligence AGI um, is not with us today. It is not likely to be here for decades, if ever. Some scientists in the area have you know raised significant questions as to whether it's ever um, likely to be achievable that we'll have technologies that are sort of human equivalents. Um, so 
it was curious um, to me when I was asked to be on this panel that we would spend time, you know, given a, a short day that we have to talk about AI and human rights, why, why is talking about personhood um, for AGIs, which are hypothetical, um, worth our time? Sort of what, what makes this question appealing to us when, you know, essentially um, it is probably about as realistic as, as um, asking about personhood for werewolves, <laughs> right? Um, and I think uh, that the answer can't really be the, or is unlikely for this population really to be the sort of utilitarian um, questions that you just raised. Because if we think about, so I think two major non human or animal human adjacent um, fictional legal persons, right? We have corporations um, and we have nation states, um, particularly, you know, the latter category relevant being in the human rights context. Um, and we have utilitarian reasons for wanting those both to be legal persons, both to grant them certain um, rights um, and you know, to incentivize particular behaviors like risk taking in the economic setting for corporations, um, also to impose obligations on them uh, for nation states. Um, I think that the only actors who are particularly likely to have those types of incentives to push for personhood for AIs at this point are corporations who are developing AIs who would like to offload some of the liability um, that are coming from these systems onto another legal person, right? It'd be very convenient if you are developing um, a black box machine learning algorithm that you have some hopes um, might be helpful, um, you would like to see widespread deployment of, but you also have um, significant concerns about or lack of ability to understand fully if, if um, you didn't have to bear the responsibility for what it did, you could say, oh, it's its own independent legal person, great. Right. But I don't think that that's why um, the terrific students who organized um, the symposium today put this panel on here. Um, and I actually think that the reason that this question comes up, and it comes up um, in this space and also um, a lot in my work, um, Daniel mentioned that I also work sort of in the um, AI art space. It comes up there a lot with around AI and creativity. Um, it's interesting to us, I think, actually in a kind of navel gazing way, where we like to ask questions about AI personhood because it gives us a new, a fresh lens to think about human personhood. Um, so I just had a, like a couple of sort of provocations um, that I would toss back to my co-panelists on that point. So for example, if we think about AI personhood, um, we might think, we, we want to think about how different AIs, like the, what, what different types of persons, you know, how that would sort of change our, our notions of personhood, right? Does a person necessarily have to feel pain to be a person? Um, we might be concerned about, um, so one of the criticisms that's come up a lot about machine learning right now is that it's um, very difficult, and machine learning does great when you give it a structured data set or a structured um, rules-based environment, like um, the way that these technologies have been able to master chess and Go, and was it World of Warcraft, or what's the recent, like, Starcraft. Starcraft. Um, <laughs> thank you, it's a real expert, expert audience. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so in these kind of structured environments, they've been able to do great. Where they're um, called on to perform tasks where they need a lot of context, like in the social media content moderation space, they perform much, much less well. So um, we might analogize that to say, um, how, would, how would thinking about um, granting personhood and, and potentially rights to an AI that has such a problem with context help us think about how um, we provide and protect rights for immigrants? Um, or people who tra themselves transition contexts. Um, it also might help us think if we think about the very different structures um, through which AIs analyze problems to help us think about human neurodiversity and think about how we might want to protect rights for, for example, autistic folks. Um, so that, that's my sort of provocation and, and the question that I think um, is most interesting in this space is actually how can um, the uh, lens of, um, of the hypothetical, the hypothetical lens of personhood for AIs help us think about um, personhood for actual people for whom we have consensus around the con uh, uh, content of that category. So do we have any responses from the panelists on that? I just want to agree uh, with that lat lat latter point. It seems that um, trying to figure out you know, what is it about ordinary persons that matters, uh, such that it matters how, how, how things go for them. Mm -hmm. um, imagining edge cases, um, there are actual edge cases, as, as you point out. 
um, that uh, that, we, that we can ex explore in, in thinking about that. But um, some some insights might only be available through um, imagined cases. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's connected to uh, things that go on in cognitive ethology and comparative psychology. They're um, developing tools to talk about the cognition of of creatures that don't have the, the same capacities that, that humans do, um, and uh, uh, to, to develop a conceptual toolbox for talking about our own capacities, it can be helpful to look at at, at non-human animals, but also at, at imagined science fiction -y cases. Did you have something to add, Terry? Well, I, I feel a little bit like I, I'm trying to make a clean separation between the legal concept and the common concept and, and uh, I feel like I get uncomfortable and I keep feeling like the conversation yeah. begins to blur that. Mm -hmm. uh, the legal concept to me is, is very clear. It's just a shorthand mm -hmm. for a collection of rights and a collection of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Corporations are the classic example of that. Mm -hmm. They're not really people in any sense. They're just, uh, in, the, in the common sense of the word, when we talk about personhood of corporations, what we mean is there's a certain collection of rights and a certain collection of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That they go hand in hand, and if they violate one or the other, then that happens. So, the, the, uh, to Jessica's point, though, I think the the, in, the, it, the way in which we can be informed actually flows the other way. Mm. What does it mean to say that this system is an AI system, and therefore, it uh, if we define personhood for in a legal sense, you know, you have you have the right to advise people on how they. Uh, 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 on their medical care, but you have to meet these standards. You know that would be the kind of thing we say. How is that informed by what we what we think about with with real people? You know, how do you punish? Uh, how do you decide what the edge cases are? That's where I think the whole thing falls apart. To be perfectly blunt, um, because what is an AI system has to be extremely well defined. You know, when you say what's a corporation, that's easy. Corporation is registered. It's on this list at this place. Otherwise, it's not a corporation. But what's an AI or an AI system? Well, we don't have a list, and we don't have a notion of what that means. Right. So the question will become: Once we define it for something we're confident is an AI uh, system, well, I mean, how about this other system that it doesn't use that technique, but it does more or less the same thing? Should those same rights and responsibilities notion of person be be applied there? So. It, that's why it's not going to work uh, to really even today talk about what, what it means to be a person uh, in the legal sense for an AI system. It won't have the practical uh, value that it does. Do you think one of the other challenges, um, as well as defining what AI is, and obviously the technology is, is moving extremely fast too, and so it eludes us. Um, but the other thing with AI is that it's, it's it's, it's not really in a precisely defined environment, aside from the computer or other device that might be temporarily sitting in as well. Um, and then the other aspect of your technology and um, AI technologies, and, and particularly um, automation, is that often there is a dance between the human and the artificial intellect. It's not necessarily human, at least right now. Human's not pressing a button and then off it goes. There is, a, there is an interoperability and that becomes really difficult to separate out the human from the machine for regulatory purposes too. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess that's that's correct. It would be difficult to draw a uh, a line around it. Mm -hmm. But that's the same thing as saying uh, how different is a corporation from its CEO? Mm -hmm. That's the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, what what to what extent is uh, uh, you know Halliburton responsible for the uh, uh, Gulf Coast? Uh, what was that? Uh, the Deep Horizon disaster, and to what extent was the CEO responsible for not having managed the or, the institution right? I'm not sure Halliburton was the right company. BP. BP. It was yeah. BP, but there was a whole bunch of other. Yeah, well, we just use BP. Simple enough. So we have you know. a fact checker in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, 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 I mean, BP was held responsible, <laughs> criminally responsible, yeah, uh, and paid a criminal fine on top of all of the uh, the the other torts that took place, but. I don't think they held, you know, the CEO didn't go to jail mm -hmm. uh, because we have, that's the point of a corporation. It's about limiting liability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole basis of corporate law and potentially law relating to uh, personhood for AI systems is about containing the liability, 
But in order for that to have meaning, uh, there has to be some kind of assets that uh, the entity controls which have value, which it can be deprived of and can be used to compensate people who are harmed by it. Mm -hmm. So this is all, you know, uh, the most interesting example of this, if I can go on for another yeah, 30 okay. seconds on this, is what they do with taxis in New York City. Mm -hmm. It's a, a great example of, of this principle uh, being applied. Uh, people who own fleets of taxis don't want to be at risk because one of their drivers uh, gets drunk and runs somebody over, that they uh, uh, might lose their whole business. You know, they got 100 taxis, and the whole thing's at risk for any one idiot doing something bad. So what they've uh, come up with is that each, each taxi is its own corporation. Legally, it's its own corporation. But they require that there be a certain amount of assets in that corporation. So that's, that effectively says, if you get into an accident, uh, the owner of the whole fleet isn't at risk any more than the assets that are available in that, because it's separable, it's a, it's a separable concept. So the same thing I think will fly with, could potentially apply with AI systems. You go and uh, get some big uh, fancy home robot of the future, and you send it to go get you a, uh, a latte at Starbucks, and uh, you know it, it runs down the street and it, it runs over somebody and kills them. Well, are you guilty of murder? You know, I think that from a philosophical standpoint, we'd say no. But you may have been negligent in not uh, properly controlling your, you know, it's like a dog that gets off a leash. In fact, that's another area of law that's very relevant to this, mm -hmm. the leash loss and uh, dog, dog bite liability, I think, is, I think that's the term. So, uh, you know, so to what degree do you want to say you're, res uh, you're responsible? What do you do with that robot if your home robot did this? Well, you might have to take that robot and give it to the people who, who uh, to whom you have some liability, because the robot itself is an asset. So you lose your robot, and they get they gain the robot. That might not be good compensation for somebody dying, but it's uh, you know it's it's certainly in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the issues in, around the legal concept that we need yeah. to deal with. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the one um, point I want to pick up again with you, Jasper, was was the idea of the artificial intellect as creator, and how that ties into the notion of of uh, legal personality or just personality generally. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've done a lot of work around kind of AI and bot creators of artwork. So, I mean, how, how do those issues play out there? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just want to compliment Jerry. You, like, I think you and my corporations professor back in law school told that tactic story identically. So they should hire you to teach corporations here. Too. <laughs> um, yeah. And here um, we are. We don't even have to move. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also, I think, um, interestingly, on the, the, just to pick up a, a thread from that, uh, the question of sort of the home robot, it's also we have a long tradition of um, product liability tort law in uh, the US legal system, which would help in a situation like that, right? So it would, like, yes, perhaps the, like, person who might get sued is the owner of the robot, but if they have a lawyer worth their salt, they're going to implead uh, the manufacturer who produced the robot, perhaps um, you know the subcontractors who produced various components of it, if it were like the tires that malfunctioned. So, um, and our legal system is actually very sophisticated at apportioning liability in circumstances like that and ensuring um, that victims are compensated. So I think worth noting people like, sometimes the AI personhood stuff comes up because people are like, well, you know, there would be no telling who would be responsible in that scenario. And yes, it would be a complicated factual question, but our, our legal system deals with complicated factual questions like that all the time. Um, so on the AI creativity point, um, I do a ton of work on AI and art. Um, I can assure you that there is no such thing as an AI or bot creator of art right now. So it's another scenario in which there are a lot of really, really interesting human-machine collaborations. AI tools that are enabling um, some really mind-blowing, awesome creativity, um, but nothing where you would get, and the, the sort of corollary in that space to this, the AI personhood conversation is the um, like AI and copyright conversation where people ask, like, could an AI be an author for purposes of the US Copyright Act? I think the answer is really clearly no, um, both under um, current US Copyright Office guidance, which they're actually, um, they're, they have a, a sort of question out for comment right now that I'm drafting a comment on, um, but also that it should be no, um, sort of aligned with the same reasons we have here. Um, there is no real reason that we would need to incentivize uh, a software program that is designed to create 
um, new materials to create new materials the way that we want to incentivize human creators, and that's the reason, you know, the sort of backbone, even constitutionally, of our intellectual property laws. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's tons of interesting um, creativity questions and some folks who are doing fascinating work around understanding human creativity through the lens of AI. So I have a um, collaborator, Sarah Schwetman, who's at MIT, um, who's a cognitive neuroscientist, who builds AI systems that closely model individual artists' creative practices as a way of better understanding human creativity, which is very much a black box for us still. So really interesting work that's happening there using AI as a tool to better understand humans, but nothing in the way of, uh, of AI artists um, independently yet. So that's really fascinating. And I, I should ask you, you, because you're a patent attorney. So what, I mean, what does that look like from the perspective of a patent attorney? Are, can bots be inventors? Um, so I think it's similar. There hasn't been any guidance from the USPTO as there had been for the Copyright Office, but there is case law that says, um, you know, um, so to become an inventor and for there to be a patent, there needs to be something called conception, which is kind of formation in the mind of an individual of the inventive idea. And there's case law that says, you know, even legal persons or corporations cannot be, um, uh, cannot qualify as an inventor. And the way all the Patent Act sections are written, it talks about individuals, minds of a person. So um, I think under the current law, not only are AI um, as software not um, eligible for being an inventor, but also even if they were uh, recognized as legal persons, I don't think under the current law would they qualify as an inventor because the law clearly says, you know, legal personhood cannot uh, qualify as an inventor. What's the rationale in the case law behind not allowing corporations to have conception? Yeah, so I mean, to be honest, when I saw the case, I, I have a little bit of mixed feelings because I mean, with regard to IP, uh, a lot of focus is on progress of the science and kind of promoting innovation. It, it talks less about kind of the ethical or, you know, um, <clears throat> moral implications, but uh, it, it, it's, it focuses kind of on the language of, similar to copyright, it having to be um, uh, something that's created within a person to incentivize that person to come up with the invention. So, okay. so oh, go right ahead. You know, if I could just make a comment on, on what Jessica was talking about, about creativity uh, in, in these systems. I think we have to be very careful before we begin to apply words like creativity mm -hmm. to these mm -hmm. machines. A machine can make a piece of art that looks like it's creative, but that does not mean the machine is creative. In the same way, you can have a program that appears to be intelligent when it plays a video game, mm -hmm. but that, that doesn't mean it is intelligent. It merely means that if a human were doing it, you would regard that as intelligent behavior. Mm -hmm. Or if a human were making that artifact, in the case of art, mm -hmm. that you would assume they were an artist. Mm -hmm. And this issue had come up uh, fascinatingly around the turn of the last century around recording devices for music, mm -hmm. because prior to that, the only way you could hear any music was to have a human being make it. And when these things came along, there was a huge debate over whether the machines were really playing, making music, or whether they were simply uh, somehow mechanically reproducing. Now, we're very comfortable with that concept today. Yeah. There's a, a, a wonderful diatribe by uh, uh, the guy who wrote Stars and Stripes Forever, I've forgotten his name, uh, Sousa. And you got, you got to look this up. It's about a page long if you're interested in this subject, where he argues vociferously that the recording device is a scourge against humanity and it's going to uh, dramatically impact our uh, sense and ability to understand, uh, to appreciate the creative act of making music. Wow. And, and of course, today we, don't, we, we live with that. But anyway, I think that's an important distinction to make. Yeah. Computers, don't, computers make art like objects, but I uh, wouldn't call them artists. Right. Do we know enough about the nature of creativity to decide what, and th that might actually be a yeah. question for you, Mark, is <laughs> if we don't understand really what's happening inside the human brain when someone creates something, how can we decide when or when not a, you know, a machine is, is engaging in that activity? That's a good question. I mean, so a lot of our mentalistic concepts can be applied not just literally but metaphorically. So you know, I think the ATM knows that I don't have 
$100 left in my checking account. Mm -hmm. and so, so it decides not to give me the money and so on. So, so you could certainly use the concept of creativity metaphorically um, to, to talk about what, what these systems are doing there. And it, it's a, an apt metaphor because they're producing um, novel objects um, that are uh, uh, you know, ba based on, on some loose um, set of principles that are programmed into it. And, um, so, but yeah, if, if you're talking about the real deal of creativity, um, then it, it, it goes back to my, uh, you know, I, I think certainly the, the systems that currently exist are far from, from the ballpark. But even if we had systems that, um, that are like, like those in science fiction, um, I, I ra rather doubt that our concept of creativity is uh, refined enough to, mm -hmm. to decide whether, whether these systems would be literally creative. So I've, I've read kind of philosophical work on <clears throat> the nature of AI and personhood, and it seems to be this concept of moral circles. You know, at what point does a another being or another entity enter into our human construct of this moral circle? Um, and so when you're looking at AI today, at the current trajectory of technology, you know, what, what do you think might be the litmus test? You know, what do you think were, could be the factors that we would use to decide if and when an artificial intellect could join our moral circle? Good, good. Well, there's kind of two ways that it, it, it might, or two respects in which we, we might consider it. That is, it, it might matter, we might, we might decide that it matters how things go for, for them, how things go for the system matters, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we think how things go for dogs and cats matters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't think that they have moral obligations and, um, to us or to each other um, most of us don't think that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, so the second uh, way that a, a system might be included in our moral circle is as a, um, a, a locus of, uh, of responsibilities and permissions. Um, and uh, that's, that's a very different matter. And you know, uh, considering how we, we deal with these questions to do with animals is, uh, is a good window on how we would mm -hmm. approach it if and when the time came many decades hence, yeah. And so is it, is sentience necessity? And, and would the uh, machine need to have an understanding of, of what their moral responsibilities were? Well, my ethics colleagues have, have all sorts of views about that, right? Um, so the, the Kantians think that the, the key thing is that um, we, are, we are reasoners who can not only value things, dogs can value treats and so on, but we can uh, evaluate our values and, um, and uh, strive to, to have objectively correct values. And, um, so the, the, the Kantians would give you that answer, whereas uh, um, others would uh, talk about their understanding of um, the, uh, the nature of pleasure and pain or uh, better and worse and, uh, and uh, uh, look for those capacities to, uh, as the entry conditions to the, that, that kind of moral personhood. So, th so there seems to be this um, consensus really that there are certainly legal practical reasons for um, endowing certain types of artificial intellect, certain species um, of machine with legal personality. But this other concept of personhood is more of a far off in the future, if we get to an AGI point, um, could be decades away, if ever. Is that kind of your well, I'll, I'll let Jerry yeah. give you the yeah. estimate. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to continue to pee on this point. I don't think this is decades away. That's not even meaningful to say. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it may be. But it may not. We have no idea. I mean, mm. aliens may land. You know, <laughs> aliens. It, that's more realistic than the AGI because you know it makes sense that they're aliens, and it makes sense that they might land. But the point that Mark made is the critical one. And, and you were talking about something about these sort of concentric circles. The real question is, how different is this thing than we are? And therefore, does it deserve the courtesy of our empathy? And if it does, then we can have a conversation about common sense personhood. But the truth is that these, these laptops and their successors, I think we're never likely as human beings to see them as somehow more closely related to us than you know whales and dogs and cats that, that 
you beha and behave and indicate in ways, a, a myriad of ways, that they are very similar to human beings. And that therefore, they're probably having feelings or something very close to that. And therefore, they deserve our empathy. I'm never going to feel that way about a, a mechanical object that was manufactured by Intel. You know, that's just too far away. So I, I, I see that's my response to your, mm -hmm. your point is, you know, how far do they have to go? Well, I, I can't, the, the old joke about AI was people in AI, they climb a tree and they claim progress on getting to the moon. And that kind of illustrates that this gap is so different mm -hmm. that it doesn't really make sense mm -hmm. to be talking about those issues. And I just want to add one point. I saw an interesting study where they had interviewed uh, leading several leading AI experts, and I believe the question was, in your view, what's the likelihood of uh, AGI being realized, or at least there's 50 percent uh, or more likelihood of a AGI being realized? And I think the average number of years that people came up with was 89 years. So this is 50 percent or more chance. But so even with AGI, I think uh, it is, you know, centuries away. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think once you reach AGI, that means they're like humans. I mean, AGI just essentially means it can meet the Alan Turing test. It can act like a person, can fool other people into believing that it is a person, and it can be intelligent. But it doesn't necessarily mean it would have consciousness or emotions or ability to feel pain. So. Um, I think a lot of times people say, you know, kind of see it as once we reach AGI, then natural personhood and rights come into play. Um, I think it becomes more relevant, but uh, they're still machines. So unless they have certain attributes like people where, you know, uh, we need to protect them more than just beyond protecting them as property, mm -hmm. I don't think there is much need or pressing need for trying to uh, give them rights as humans. Yeah, sort of um, picking up on that thread of surveying experts in the field, um, I have some um, work in progress uh, where we have taken, uh, a, collected a data set of 32 of the, like, these like AI ethical principles documents or rights respecting AI. Some of them are um, come explicitly from a human rights framework um, and collected about 80 data points about each one. And so in preparing for this panel, I went through and just um, did a quick check to see if any of those documents, many of which are prepared by experts in the field or, or with their um, uh, uh, input at least, um, had any bearing on this. And the one, I think, the sense in which there, we, sort of, we have sort of grouped the principles into themes. The closest theme that has relevance to this is um, that many of these documents talk about the responsibility of ethical AI to promote human values. Um, and so there are some, and we actually, we may have, I don't know if it's loaded, but I may have a slide that shows you um, like the cool data visualization um, that we have for this project just to give you a preview because it won't be published for another month or two. Um, but um, so in that, in that theme of promotion of human values, uh, we see themes like um, wanting AI to improve humans' freedom of action and self-determination um, or um, not compromise human freedom and autonomy. The only document that like, the document that comes perhaps closest. Sorry, I'll just um, bring it up. Oh no, no worries, no wrong. <laughs> um, is uh, the Montreal Declaration. Um, and it comes close in that it distinguishes essentially from AI systems, which are its subject, uh, all AI systems and then sentient beings as just two totally different categories. Um, but it's kind of neat to see um, the data visualization um, just so you can get a sense of uh, these. Yeah, you can show, if you go, um, so it's another couple of slides down. Oops. There, you just scroll down. I think, oh, yeah, it's that one. Oh, maybe it didn't come through. It's the one with the exclamation point on it. There should be an image on that page. Ah, here it is. There we go. Um, yeah, so we have this incredible, um, this is dummy data in this one, but uh, we have this incredible data visualization student named Arushi Singh from Northeastern University who's built this really awesome chart for us. So um, you see um, each spoke of this wheel is a different one of these principles documents. Um, and then each concentric ring is one of the themes. And the size of the circle will represent the depth with which um, that particular document covers the theme. 
Um, so when we publish this, we'll publish the data visualization, we'll publish a white paper that explains some of the material, and then we'll also publish um, the underlying uh, data. And I wanted to share it with you in, in part because I'm hoping that it will be the foundation of um, a bunch of uh, work to advance our understanding um, of this type of document because I think that um, while there are benefits to it that we need to sort of move toward um, norms development in this space, there are also um, it doesn't take us all the way there, right? These documents don't get us toward um, the accountability questions. There have been a bunch of great questions from the audience on those questions. So um, just wanted to share um, that work that's forthcoming and, um, and hope that you'll use it when it's ready. That's really impressive, yeah. Um, so given we've, it's about quarter to five, maybe we should open things up to the audience and see if there are any questions for our panelists. One over here. Uh, so I agree. I'm, I'm pretty much on the same wavelength as Jerry, and so I. But I would like to uh, outdo his um, skepticism by saying, yeah, not only are these questions of personhood um, currently not relevant, nor will they be relevant in the near future. But what we need to do is um, address the fact that even though we know that, many millions of people won't realize that, and that's a potential exploit. Um, so along the same lines as um, what Jessica was doing, I was thinking of um, in, in Britain, one of the research councils, the, 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 the one that's technological, the one that's most relevant to AI, uh, they came up with a set of robotics guidelines, but I think it applies to AI in general. And one of their few principles was that um, it included an anti-deception, they included an anti-deception uh, principle. So they said, um, uh, robots should not be designed in a deceptive way to exploit vulnerable users. And when they elaborated on that, they said, the illusion of emotions and intent should not be used to exploit vulnerable users. For example, um, people shouldn't be tricked into, you know, manufacturers shouldn't try to claim that the robot has needs or desires to, to get, you know, money out of people to continue, you know, um, supporting the, um, the, the techn technology. So, in fact, not only, I, I think that the most relevant legal consideration here is not about should we grant uh, r rights to r um, robots or AIs, but is rather how should we stop people from trying to convince others that obligation should be endowed uh, to these devices? And, or, or is that something that we should get involved with? Should, should there be um, legal intervention or policy intervention in order to prevent that type of, uh, of uh, mis I would say, deception to go on. Do any of the panelists want to respond to that? I think it's a very good point. Yeah. So on, on the flip side, though, it, it might be that uh, there'd be some users who would be pleased to be deceived into thinking that they had a friend or, um, uh, yeah. Like the, the um, broad and enthusiastic customer base for the robot dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think related to that question, actually, I was um, noticing it's like almost when you, whenever you look for like clip art, which I often have to do, or like you know any kind of images to go in these presentations, the image that comes up for AI is a, is like a humanoid robot, right? So these this the trend toward like associating AI with AGI and associating it with it, it's deep in our like language and, and and visual language and conception of these things. And that's part of why it sort of sneakily keeps recurring, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, can I just clarify that they explicitly said in their guidelines that of course it will be probably very desirable to have, you know, um, uh, AI and robot entertainments where people temporarily suspend their disbelief and all that. They're not against that. They're just saying yeah. it should always be possible, however, for the use to ask, well, is this really the case? Mm -hmm. And if so, we give them an clear answer to the thing you know, what I'm saying. Yeah, I think a lot of governments and NGOs are kind of as a first step coming up with guidelines and code of ethics and reports kind of, yeah, I guess that's captured mm -hmm. in this uh, image yeah. as well. But I think they're a little bit cautious because especially in a very rapidly emerging technology space, you know, uh, oftentimes coming up with, you know, regulatory um, uh, measures can have a huge uh, negative effect. So I think it's moving in the right direction that first, you know, all the con a lot of governments and companies and NGOs are looking at the issue. And I think there are a lot of common themes, human deception, one of them, 
uh, preventing human uh, deception of humans uh, being one of them, transparency, uh, human oversight, et cetera. And I think data like this will really help in kind of figuring out what the common themes or issues are and then seeing whether you know, regulations will actually be helpful. I mean, with data privacy, uh, there has been a lot more actual laws in place uh, in other areas, not so much, but um, I the think. The cross principle has both ways, right? So yeah. you can say, for those very same reasons you cited about we're not really sure, means we shouldn't, we should say by default not allow uh, the, the deception of users, rather than say the default is to just let tech companies do whatever they want until they come up with a reason to stop them doing No, I, I agree. Uh, I agree, but. Can I, can I expand on Yon's point for just Please a second? Please do, yeah. You know, when we talk about AI principles, mm -hmm. to me, it, it, it's, again, shading into this question of, you know, who should be principal. I think a much better way to think about this, because it's a valuable exercise, mm -hmm. is to uh, think about it as we need to develop engineering standards mm -hmm. for the development of products that use these technologies. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly reasonable. You know, we, you don't want to build cars where the wheels fall off. Well, mm -hmm. if wheels falling off cars is a big problem, we need to have uh, engineering standards for making sure that doesn't happen. Uh, if you're building uh, AI robots that mow lawns, uh, you need to have some uh, engineering standards that say that it must incorporate some notion of when it's on the lawn and when it's not on the lawn. Mm -hmm. I'm just making this up as an example mm -hmm. so that uh, it, it can uh, disable itself or go into yeah. some kind of safe mode when it's not in what engineers call standard operating envelope. That's the mm -hmm. actual term they use for that. Um, so I think about it in terms of engineering standards on the one hand, and on the other about application of products, which is uh, pro uh, comes back to this product liability. Mm -hmm. I think those are the right perspectives to which talk about what should be going on with AI. And the problem that I have is most of the groups that are dealing with this are not expert enough to have any uh, useful opinions on a lot of these subjects. Mm -hmm. Now we're beginning to move in that direction. People, for example, in face recognition, now we can talk about, well, these are the kinds of problems that go wrong. And therefore, a responsible uh, engineer should uh, make sure that these standards are met before they apply that technology. That's a very productive and useful way, and I think that applies to AI just as it does to building bridges or any other form of engineering. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just weighing in um, just with a point of the, on the regulation is, you know, when it comes to regulation of technology, the cautionary tale from history is regulating the technology rather than the application. Um, and some arguments um, for legal personality um, are that it really facilitates application of existing laws to the technology rather than the creation of new laws that are going to be outdated by the time the technology develops in a few months or a couple of years' time. Um, so legal personality in some ways might for instance, um, facilitate the application of things like anti-discrimination laws, um, existing laws, rather than create new AI-specific laws that might be completely outdated by the time the technology changes. Um, yeah, so that's just one point. Oh, Bruce has a, has a point here, too. Um, Where's it, the mic? I love oh, oh. Uh, The panel loves YouTubers. I, I, I would say I still love the panel. Um, the, the notion of SPVs, special purpose vehicles, is well known in uh, creditors' rights, bankruptcy, remote finance. So if I combine an SPV with AI with blockchain, I, and then I'm in front of a court, and I bring an in-rim action to control the race, who do I serve? And who would actually abide by the injunction? And, and the answer is we don't know, and probably no one. So that definition, if you can't solve that riddle, you don't have a person. And that's the problem. I mean, I've met with the Yasuni tribe in Ecuador. They just re recently won a, uh, a litigation against the oil company who wanted to mine the the rainforest or, or explore in the rainforest. If you wanted to put a rainforest under a trust you know, arrangement and put it inside a, an AI managed regime, mm -hmm. how would you ever you know, fix it when it turned out to have been wrong? We've had trusts 
that were built for the Barnes Foundation, for example, in Philadelphia, where you had to go to court uh, and, and, and update the circumstances by which the trust door had, had created or settler had, had created it. So my, uh, this is not long-winded. I, I, unless you have the ability to respond to court process, I don't know how we can be talking about personhood. And, and, and it's different, Jerry, obviously, than could we get an AGI. I, I think it's just well, stacking these legal principles and seeing where they lead. I, I can say just to, to, to uh, uh, an example that might be more accessible to, to us, perhaps a bit more accessible to some of the audience, is during the Middle Ages, I, it was uh, people brought court cases against animals. Uh, you know, that pig tore up my garden and they charged the pig. This is, this is really the case. Most yeah. people don't realize this actually happened. And it ran into exactly the problem you have. Who's the respondent? You know, the, uh, there's a famous case. Uh, it's, it's a very funny case, and I'm tempted to go into it, but I won't, uh, about a bunch of rats eating barley. And uh, they, they, the problem was the rats couldn't be served notice, and they got off, you know. So, <laughs> so this is a real case, really happened um, in the 1700s. So it made this point that you're making. Uh, you can't really imbue something with personhood in this sense unless there's somebody to respond, you know, if you, if you make a claim. And so uh, I think that's a very, very realistic issue. So is that in the wheel of America? I don't know. Is the notion of human oversight, maybe? <clears throat> <clears throat> yes. So um, there is, uh, you'll see uh, the third ring in is human control of technology. Um, so. Uh, there are many, and you know, that there's a fair level of, this data is not really accurate, but there's a fair level of, rep, of representation of, of sort of some notion of human control of technology. And each of those themes, rep, there's a number of, uh, each of, yeah, those are themes, they're principles underneath each theme. Um, but uh, we, I would say that I have not seen any of these documents directly responsive to your hypothetical. Um, outlining the risks of um, sort of like using other extant legal means um, to deliberately insulate an AI from liability. Um, however, most of these documents, and this is, you know, I think either a bug or a feature, depending on your perspective, are much higher level than that um, and are much more aspirationally um, sort of focused, uh, oriented. Um, and so, yeah, where, where it would sort of resound is in this notion that there should be um, a human in the loop or uh, like, you know, a, a responsible party, something like that. Yeah. 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 There's an interesting paper by Professor uh, Sean Bayern, um, kind of using existing corporate laws, uh, and I think in this case it was just an LLC, but, you know, and I forget the exact steps, but then you form the board and then you kind of remove the board members, and in practice, essentially, uh, an AI could be in charge of, uh, as a legal person, for all intents and purposes, until the LLC gets canceled, I guess. but. So this is an interesting question, and I think uh, there hasn't been much discussion of that, just because people don't think that is possible, although, because no one has tried it, I guess, or uh, mm -hmm. has tried it much. So in that instance, it would have to be adequately capitalized, right? Yeah. So that's, so that's sort of the, the cost of it, is that you have, it, it doesn't work unless you put enough money behind it. Yes, um, initially, but right. if it makes money on its own, yes. then maybe. Okay. You know, then it's the paperclip um, machine, yeah. and we're all paperclips. <laughs> So when you mentioned Ecuador, I thought you were going to talk about that, uh, the lake that had been granted legal personhood status, um, as has, you know, in, in a number of other countries, New Zealand, India, even the US and Ohio. And I think that's a really great example of how anything could be a legal person for utilitarian purposes. And we do it every day for corporations, partnerships, ships, churches, temples, all sorts of things. Um, the question is, you know, is that going to be helpful for us in terms of regulating the, at these emerging technologies? Mm 
<laughs> Just for example. Um, oh, a question right up here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, just right here first. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, I agree 100 percent with um, what Jerry and Jessica are saying about AGI basically being a fantasy. Uh, just a couple of points. I also agree that I think the more interesting thing is one, it's a really compelling fantasy, as people have noted. And so, what does it say about us? Uh, so, to that point. Oh, and then lastly, even though it is a fantasy, like a lot of real money in the real world is being made selling this fantasy to like real people who don't know it's a fantasy. So anyway, we might know it's a fantasy, but it's not really widely known to be such. Um, but my real point is, uh, what I think is most interesting is, is what does it say about us. Um, to that end, I um, want to push back slightly on what Jerry said about like, oh, nobody's like, you don't feel anything if your laptop if it gets missed or replaced or something. That might be true to a certain extent, but I think with the advent of things like mobile, um, if you actually like try leaving your phone at home for a day, you're not going to feel like your phone is like a sentient being, but it's like um, it's less about like. AI, like the machine having a soul, and more like the machine has become part of me. And it, like, if I'm don't, if it's not connected to me, like I lost part of myself. So I just think that's an interesting thing. And I think as you know, mobile transitions to wearables, it's only going to become more a part of ourselves. And anyway, there's no answers there, but it's something we should think about. Mm -hmm. um, and the second point is, I've been thinking about this, and uh, what Jessica um, said was very much in line with this, which is, like, I feel like it's such a compelling fantasy for AI. Um, AGI rather, and for me it's kind of like the modern day uh, religion. Like we used to like circle around the tribes and like make fires and like maybe pray, believe in like animal gods and pray to the animal gods and now we know that that's stupid, but now we pray to these like mythical machine gods and like I, that's my perspective on, on AGI. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I've seen some really good web comics that have people like, you know, curled over their phones as though they're in um, prayerful postures. <laughs> that is my main response. And you do, you see it on the, if you commute by bus or subway, you see it every day. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, please. Well, I just want to say, people get inappropriate uh, emotional attachments to objects all the time. People fall in love with their car. Uh, so uh, that's really what you're talking about. Uh, I'm just saying from, a, from a, a legal standpoint, I don't think we need to pass laws to protect cars from people. That just doesn't make any sense to me. And, and that, that's... And I agree with all those same, uh, same points, but I do want to mention it's, you know, but there are a lot of uh, significant ethical and economic and social impacts AI is having on, you know, the world today. So I think the focus needs to be on, you know, what are those effects and how can we, what types of measures can we put in place to help protect uh, societies while promoting innovation. Um, but oftentimes, I think, because it's a more interesting topic at first, people say, you know, is AGI possible? And are they going to take all our jobs? Are they going to, you know, Terminator uh, uh, scenario? Um, but I think the focus needs to come back to, sure, maybe AGI is not possible, but their, their, their advancements are uh, very significant, and they are having a lot of impact on humanity. So what can we do to uh, promote better use of AI? That's a really interesting point. Oh, do you yeah, want to? I just want to respond. I, I agree 100% that, like, we want to do these things. But I would say that, like, we, I think you're correct. We think it has to be done. It might be irrational, maybe, but it's not inappropriate. It's like we human beings. There's something about us that's hardwired to be these machines that we connect with or live in or have in our bodies. Like, eventually, we just can't help but, like, feel connected to them. And that's not the machine's fault, but that's part of us. So, anyway, it's not inappropriate. Maybe it's not logical or rational. Well, it's, it's certainly true. I, I think one of the most interesting areas where this has uh, taken form, in, really in the law, is what is called moral rights to art. Mm -hmm. So an artist creates something, mm -hmm. uh, and even though you, you may sell it and somebody uh, down the line may own it, that doesn't, they do not have the right to uh, modify it in, uh, in certain respects. That's called the moral rights. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't be sold. They're retained by the uh, creator of it. So maybe there's some application of that in this domain that might also make sense. I would kick in that there's a discussion in philosophy about what they call the extended mind hypothesis. According to these theorists, it's literally true that um, uh, some tools that you use contribute to your mental states, um, not ca causally, but constitutively. So if, um, if you have uh, notes in your, in your phone, um, they can 
partly constitute what you, what you know or believe. Um, I think it's, it's true that we use, a, we use language to, uh, to attribute beliefs and knowledge to people based on not what's in their brain, but what, what they have in their notepad. Right? So does Susan know the meeting starts at noon? Yes, I think that can be true. If, even if you asked her, she had to say, I have to look that up. Um, so, but I, I, th I think w whether it's strictly true that, that Susan knows that is a different question. And uh, that's a real deal question. And I, I think this is exactly the kind of case that there's no answer. Hmm. Yeah, whether it's literally true that, that Susan. It's, uh, it's uh, supported by um, conceptual uh, argumentation about what, what constitutes, say, knowing something or believing something. And, and, and the idea is that the, the causal role played by these electronic records that you have in your, in your hand is uh, sufficiently like the, the causal role that a belief plays in the brain um, to constitute a genuine belief. Okay, so I think we've got uh, time for one more question. Hi, uh, yeah, so I'm curious, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier on about the line drawing problem of what is, so a uh, person that requires a discrete thing, like whether it's the legal fiction, you need that entity. What, what happens in a world where AI systems are increasingly interconnected, increasingly like, we can't really say this is one system, they're like, I guess how, how do we create these nebulous boundaries? I think that's a really important question. Does anyone have any thoughts? I mean, I think that there's no reason that corporations, for example, have to exist. Corporations are not natural, right? They're, they're creatures of the corporate law. So, and corporations, we could also say, you know, and I think many people do feel this way. They talk about shadow corporations or, you know, um, different shell corporations, et cetera. Um, also sort of mysterious and interconnected, right? But the um, structure of corporate law helps us clearly define those boundaries. Um, and so if and to the extent it becomes in the future more necessary to regulate AIs in this way, I think we would just have to develop those same types of systems that where we would set out what, you know, the appropriate standards for the boundaries between them. Um, Maybe ownership, yeah. for example, of yeah. AI, if it's in a commercial context, I guess, or the yeah. developer. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, code. I mean, you could look at the underlying code. You could, yeah. yeah. On, on that point, I think that the existing example where uh, this most uh, might inform your question the best is <clears throat> around the idea of what is a piece of software. Mm -hmm. It can take many forms, can be run on different machines, or uh, say a game that can be run on many platforms in different ways. You know, we've had to sort this out in the law. You know, did you copy that game? That's still a meaningful question, even though the game itself is not as well defined as one might think. That's not to say there's no definition, but it's interesting that the law has had to deal with a situation that was uh, equivalent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, a history of dealing with complexity in the law, and it, obviously, in many ways, society is becoming more complex with the inter introduction of these types of technologies. Um, but it's not like we don't have experience dealing with this stuff. Um, does anyone else have any kind of final thoughts? I think we've got about one minute left. No? Thank you to the students who organized this conference. As a yeah. clinical teacher, I have to say it was especially exciting for me to be invited to an event that was student-led. So congrats yeah. to um, Yasmin and Marlene and Steinian. Yeah, they've Go done students. a really fantastic job.